because our country has officially slid into a rabbit hole. I would call it La La Land, Crazy Town, the Twilight Zone. Hey, call it what you wish, but what's playing out before our eyes makes George Orwell's 1984 appear to be a newspaper story from 2024. Folks, we are living it. I mean, well-educated people pretend that they don't know what a woman is. What? Even a recently appointed Supreme Court justice said she didn't know because she wasn't a biologist. Hey, I'm not a biologist either, but I think I know what a woman is. <laughs> and unlike Justice Katanji Brown Jackson, I've known the difference as long as I can remember going back to my earliest memories at age three. Not that complicated. But we are living in the crazy times when a man who claims to be a woman goes into the women's locker room at Planet Fitness, undresses and shaves his bearded face in the women's locker room. And when a real woman complains that a man is hanging out in the women's locker room, she gets told that her Planet Fitness membership is being revoked because she didn't go along with this ridiculous and revolting perversion. You know, I'm reminded of the great classic comedy, No Time for Sergeants. Remember that? Will Stockdale is told that a woman officer isn't a woman, just an officer. Oh, I'm a dog. I never heard of saluting no woman before. She ain't no woman. She's a captain. I seen a captain stand there, so I come to attention and I saluted. A captain, that's all. A woman captain. A captain captain. My dog, don't, don't you understand nothing, Will? When you're in uniform, you ain't supposed to notice whether, whether a person is a man or a woman or what. A, a captain's a captain, a, a major's a major, and a general's a general. Ben, you mean to tell me that you didn't notice that she was a woman? A captain, that's all I seen. Well, well dog, it, Ben, I know she's a woman right off. You know the difference between then and now? In those days, all that was funny people realized that it was ridiculous not to know the difference. Today, we get laughed at if we pretend we do know the difference. How is that for you? By the way, a week or so ago, congressional hearings turned into a tumble, a tumble into a black hole of insanity as Democrats got confronted with information and then proceeded to declare that what they just heard was the opposite of what had just been said. Far left loon, AOC, ask a question as to what crimes the Biden family members had committed. And when congressional witness Tony Bobolinsky started listing them, she ignored his answers and declared, so there weren't any. Huh? Folks, I've come to realize that people like her are not serious people. I'm reminded of the scene in the movie Naked Gun, where Detective Frank Drebin, played by Leslie Nielsen, assures people that everything is okay. Excuse me. All right, move on. Nothing to see here. Please disperse. Nothing to see here. Yeah, nothing to see here. That's exactly what I saw at that hearing this week. I'm now convinced the Democrats simply take their cues from Hollywood which is the true land of make-believe and fantasy. I mean, they surely see and hear what's actually happening around them, but they pretend that it is the opposite. Hey, Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, surely one of the most incompetent people ever to get a federal job, has repeatedly testified that our border is secure. Secretary Mayorkas, do you continue to maintain that the border is secure? Yes, and we are working day in and day out to enhance its security, Congressman. Right. Thanks, sir. Have, I get it. I just wanted to make sure that that's, that still is your, uh, your assessment. Yep, it looks secure to me there, uh, Mr. Secretary, as those folks just pile in and beat the stuffing out of the immigration officers. Real secure and under control. And if you think it's wrong having 10 million people illegally storm the border and find their way into cities and towns where they are being put into hotels, provided meals and health care, and gift cards for spending money 
while our own U.S. veterans are sleeping on the streets and in cardboard boxes? Oh, if you think that, well, you're a xenophobe and a racist. You know, when I hear leftists explain things, I sometimes wonder if they're capable of seeing what the rest of us clearly see. Do they not see gas prices? The prices of bread, butter, and bacon? Rampant, violent crime in our streets? Maybe they're all living in a world created by that wonderful character, Sergeant Schultz from the old TV series, Hogan's Heroes. I see nothing. <laughs> yep, I think most of the Democrats really are Sergeant Schultz. And when they tell me that Joe Biden is the sharpest, most focused and in control president in history, I think I'm seeing a scene from the original movie, The Manchurian Candidate, where brainwashed soldiers extol the virtues of a man that in reality, they can't stand. Raymond Shaw is the kindest, bravest, warmest, most wonderful human being I've ever known in my life. Raymond Shaw is the bravest, kindest, warmest, most wonderful human being I've ever known in my life. I said Raymond Shaw is the kindest, warmest, bravest, most wonderful human being I've ever known in my life. And it's like when they say, and Joe Biden is the sharpest, most capable, thoughtful man that I've ever seen as president in my life. I'm thinking, I'm watching the Manchurian candidate all over again. <laughs> and it's hard to dispute when the dishonest and discredited media goes right along with all this nonsense. Like this classic moment from CNN, where CNN claims that protests were fiery, but mostly peaceful. What you're seeing behind me is one of multiple locations that have been burning in Kenosha, Wisconsin, over the course of the night. A second night since Jacob Blake was seen shot in the back seven times by a police officer. And what you are seeing now, these images came and come in stark contrast to what we saw over the course of the daytime hours in Kenosha and into the early evening, which were largely peaceful demonstrations in the face of law enforcement. Mm. You see it right there on the screen, it said fiery, but mostly peaceful protest as the whole city burns down behind the guy. There you have it, right there. This is why you can't believe much of anything you hear from the media are from the far left these days. Because to put it simply, they have lost their ever loving minds. <laughs> Well, my next guest has found himself in the FBI's crosshairs for committing the crime, and I'm telling you a serious crime, the crime of journalism. Yeah. He spent the last few years reporting fairly and accurately on the injustices carried out in the wake of the January 6th Capitol riot. And for that, he's become a victim of those injustices himself. Earlier this month, he was arrested on trumped-up misdemeanor charges. Misdemeanor at which time he was literally put in chains in an attempt to belittle and humiliate him, just as they would a violent criminal, for misdemeanor charges. And while he was shackled and taken into the courtroom, several others in court who were charged with felonies and violent crimes were neither cuffed nor shackled. He's here speaking out for the truth, the First Amendment, justice for himself and thousands of others who are being tried in the witch trials since the events of January 6th, and he's here speaking out for you. Please welcome investigative journalist Steve Baker. <laughs> Steve, I'm so glad to have you here. Your story has me exercised. I mean, it's, it's amazing. And I want to begin because you were covering the situation January the 6th at the Capitol. Right. There's a number of video clips that show that you were not participating in the riot. You didn't hit anyone. You didn't break through anything. No. What did they say they were arresting you for? Well, they have said that I'm one of those uh, accidental tourists, as they say, mm -hmm. you know, one of the people that walked in after several hundred other people walked through open doors and the police had stood down. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I 
followed the story where the story went. I started at the ellipse at the at the White House. Yeah. I worked my way uh, with tens of thousands of other people that were moving that direction. Most people don't even know that there were an additional six permitted events, legally permitted events by the Capitol Police uh, on the, the Capitol grounds that day. So people were moving over there not to storm the Capitol, yeah. not to uh, uh, become insurrectionists of any kind, but they were going to the uh, additionally scheduled events that Congress members were going to be speaking at, as a matter mm. of fact, on stages that were set up on the Capitol grounds. This was all. This has all been obscured by the media, and that. Yeah, we, that, we don't hear that. No, of we don't not. hear that at all. And you didn't hear any of that from the Pelosi's January select, uh, six select committee. Very select. Very select. <laughs> Unselect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so, so I, I just followed the story where the story went. I, I got there at exactly one nineteen. This was three minutes after President Trump uh, left the stage, mm -hmm. done at the ellipse. I immediately saw that there were problems. I turned my camera on. I had, a, I had my camera, I had my backpack, I had my, my tripod, I had the man on the street microphone. I was going to try and interview some people, get their impressions about what had happened that day at the speeches. And then the story turned, it turned dark. And I did what I'm supposed to do. And I rolled film, as they used to say, mm -hmm. uh, for about an hour on the West Battle Line. And then there was a breakthrough. I was not part of that breakthrough. I had no idea, I couldn't see what was happening up on the upper terrace where people broke through those windows and the doors. And then, as I said, as people began moving that way, I followed them in and did what 60 other journalists did that day that went through broken windows and broken doors. Now, I find it interesting too that you weren't arrested immediately after this. It was three years later, right. just recently, a month or so ago, um, Right after, I'm sure it's a coincidence, Steve, but right after you had done some stories about the mystery surrounding the so-called pipe bombs that had been supposedly placed at both the Democratic National right. Committee and the Republican National Committee. Right. What were you reporting about those pipe bombs that didn't quite jive with the official version that was told three years ago. What I first discovered is that what the FBI had been telling us for three years is that the person who found that bomb was a quote unquote passerby. I discovered that in fact, it was a plainclothes Capitol Police officer who found that uh, alleged bomb. And then the second thing that I found is I've been, well, first of all, I've been very fortunate in my work in that I've had more access to the Capitol CCTV viewing room mm -hmm. where all of this video is archived, that 41,000 hours yeah. of video we hear about. I've had more access to that and with my team from Blaze Media to review those tapes than any other journalist that I'm aware of. And so through that process, we were looking very closely at this scene and we were discovering that on the, the investigative scene of the bomb after it was discovered, that somebody up in the Capitol Police Command Center, six blocks away or so, were ordering those cameras turned away from the scene. Now this was highly irregular, highly unusual. Of, of all of the, the EOD specialists, the FBI, ATF, lo local law enforcement, everyone I've ever spoke to involved in that type of thing says that you want those cameras on the scene sure. to record the investigation. See what you did wrong, see what you did right. Even if they're using classified techniques or technologies to defuse or to demolish the bomb, you still want that on there for training later but these most important cameras were being turned away, three of them, the three cameras that could have recorded the whole scene, but they forgot one. They forgot a camera, and off to the far left edge of a camera they forgot about, I found in the Capitol CCT archives, I found the bomb robot come over to the very edge of the screen and detonate the bomb. And it was like a firecracker, hmm. like that. And so we were able to show that to the American people. But uh, the most important uh, story, uh, Governor, that I've found so far was earlier than that, when in the room I was researching the testimonies of a couple of uh, Capitol Police officers, including a special agent on the, what they call their dignitary protection detail, mm -hmm. who had um, testified in the first Oath Keepers trial. And I was covering that trial. I was in the media room covering that every day for nine weeks and something about his testimony didn't sit right with me. So I started looking into it. And a year into that investigation, I found what I called the kill shot. And it was the video that proved that this particular special agent who happened to be the 
head of Nancy Pelosi's security detail, could not have seen what he claimed to have seen in the trial because he was in another building at the time. And we found that evidence. No wonder they came after you. Steve, this is, it's disturbing and there's more to this. That's why I want to keep you over. So hang tight. I want to have a continued conversation with Steve Baker. Uh, it's coming up right after the break. In the meantime, Keith Bilbrey, just let our folks at home know what else we have coming up on the show because they're not going to want to miss Steve Baker or all the other stuff we have coming. Well, later tonight, the powerful story of our Hucks hero, Stephen Gade, a country singer, Morgan Miles, with an amazing musical performance, and it's all tonight on Huckabee. MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at GovMikeHuckabee on X. Welcome back, everyone. We're visiting with Steve Baker, journalist with Blaze TV. He was arrested recently by the FBI, but it wasn't just that you were arrested. Uh, there was an attempt to really put you through it. Leg shackles, <laughs> handcuffs, taking your shoelaces away right. and marching you in a perp march through the federal courthouse. Um, there were other people who were arrested who were being charged with felonies. They were not cuffed or shackled. Correct. You were charged with misdemeanors. That's like traffic tickets and right. stuff that doesn't typically put a person in prison. Why did they shackle you? Are you that dangerous a person, Steve? You don't look like it. Uh, apparently, uh, the FBI and the Department of Justice considered me to be so because, Governor, I, I think that we have entered an era now where you can have, you can be a misdemeanor terrorist, according yeah. to the government. How is that possible? It's, it's, it's insane. The, the weaponization of these agencies against the American people, particularly those who don't comport or see the narrative exactly as they have approved it to be, and especially those of us who don't submit our own stories that comport with Nancy Pelosi's preferred mm -hmm. narrative about January 6th. She famously said uh, a year after the event, during the first anniversary commemorative events that she put on, she said, we must um, preserve the narrative of January 6th. So, no, she said, we must establish and preserve the narrative of January 6th. And that was the purpose of her committee. And of course, those of us who began to do the work to begin peeling back the layers and you know connecting the dots and putting the pieces of the puzzle together that starting are starting to reveal that that narrative as they established it is not exactly correct. We're the ones that are now the targets. And, and that's what's happening. That's what's frightening to me because as a journalist, you have a right to report what you see, what you find, what you can discover. If, if somebody wants to dispute that, the way to do it is to argue your points, which is right. a legitimate re rebuttal. That's right. That's not what they did. They used the power of the police agencies of government to say, it's not just that what you said was wrong. They didn't prove that or even attempt to prove it. They just said, you can't say it because right. it embarrasses us. So we're going to put you in leg shackles, take you to jail and charge you with crimes. And what is frightening is if they can do this to you, a journalist who's supposed to be protected by the First Amendment, they can do it to every single person in this country. And I don't want people to forget that that's why we're talking here tonight. That's why this election is important. It's why holding people accountable for these kind of activities where they abuse the power of government. Um, you got to promise me you will come back and let's continue this conversation as your case plays out. Because we need to keep our eyes on this because it's all of our story it's just that, unfortunately, you're having to go through the worst of it. But we appreciate your being willing to articulate what this is uh, all about. It's very important, and you truly do need to keep up with this important story. It continues to develop. And if you want to know how, go to Huckabee.tv. We have links to Steve Baker's social uh, media platforms and what is the ongoing process. Please keep your eye on this case. Go to Huckabee.tv. We want to connect you to Steve Baker. Keith, why don't you tell us what's coming up next here on the show? Well, coming up next, Rocky Malloy shares his incredible redemption story. Then later, the mind-bending magic of the conjurers will blow your mind right here on Huckabee.
Well, the work of Samaritan's Purse is truly never done. Samaritan's Purse works all around the clock to help and serve those who are suffering and broken. And I hope you'll join me and so many others in demonstrating the love of Jesus through the outreach of Samaritan's Purse. Your financial gift provides medicine, food, shelter, and much more to the poor and hurting who may have experienced a lot of devastation. You can call Samaritan's Purse now or we make it easy. Just go and scan the QR code that you see on your screen right now and you can visit their website. And by doing that, help bring hope to those who really need it in Jesus' name. My next guest has made it his mission to put certified chaplains in schools across the country. <laughs> but you won't believe how he got here. While serving as a merchant marine commander, he got sentenced to life in a Mexican prison for conspiracy to overthrow the government, as well as for international drug trafficking. Miraculously, he was arrested, sentenced, jailed, and then pardoned all within 72 hours. You might say Rocky Malloy of the National School Chaplain Association had quite the rocky road to where he is today, but it led him to finding God and devoting his life to preaching the gospel with an organization that reaches 27 million people across 30,000 schools in 23 countries. Please give a very warm welcome to Rocky Malloy. When I'm reading this introduction and I'm thinking, okay, in 72 hours, you go from hopelessness to scat, get out of here and, and, and make it. What on earth was that about? Governor, it was, you know what? I was sent to prison. Three men were hung the morning. I spent the night with them getting their deathbed confession. And later that afternoon, the arresting officer comes to take me, but I thought they were gonna go assassinate me somewhere else because I was an American. No. There was all kind of issues. There was one other American in this prison. I was shaking fingers with him through a cyclone fence when behind me was an audible voice that said, I've set you free, now go do my work. Mm. He heard it, he saw it. I mean, he, you know, he's looking in the thin air. I thought I had a license from God to be mm. a mercenary. I mean. To help, I was trying to help people. That's yeah. why I got in so much trouble, but I've been serving the Lord ever since, and it's been one miracle after another. I mean, it really is. When I think about you were almost put away for the rest of your life, now you've created a chaplaincy program in schools, and that in itself is fascinating to me because most of us would think, well, you can't have chaplains in schools. So how are you able to get that done? Well, there's 10,000 federal chaplains. Chaplains have been around since before the U.S. Constitution. General George Washington instituted Articles of Confederation. So I saw it as a way to bring God in prayer back to school legally, and it's held. So what makes it different to do it through a chaplaincy than through a, a, a spiritual Christian club on campus or some other way? It's the name. Chaplain has been consistently upheld by Supreme Court and district courts for 250 years. Mm. So if you're a spiritual person, maybe that would start the discussion new. Mm -hmm. But as a chaplain, you're coming in with 200 years of case law. So you're going into states all across this country. Tell us about some of the states and, and was it hard to be able to establish a chaplaincy program in some of these states? Well, Texas passed it. Governor Abbott signed it into law yeah. in uh, June. Um, Florida just passed it. They sent it to the governor. He looks like he's committed to sign it. Your daughter loves it. She better sign it. <laughs> she better sign it. So there's about 17 states that just, it just took off like a comment because it is so needed. Chaplaincy... Yeah. It's, it's so critical in military, first responders, airports, everywhere else. Why wouldn't we have them in schools? And what do the chaplains do in the schools? How, how can you serve without getting in trouble? Their number one thing is situation awareness, just yeah. to observe what's happening and to pr provide spiritual care that is so important and it's confidential. My youngest daughter just finished high school and she wanted to be a medical professional. Three of her classmates tried to commit suicide and she didn't know who to tell. 
Mm. because she was afraid it would go on her transcript. A chaplain mm. is a safe person, and that's why chaplains make campuses safer. Now, are the chaplains volunteers most of the time? Are, are they paid? H how does that work? State of Texas said, we'll pay them. So the state of Texas is going to pay for the chaplains to be in the public schools? Yes, sir. That's amazing. I don't think most of us realize that not only is happening, but that even could happen. It can, it can happen. Teachers are the only um, public service people that do not have access to spiritual care. Why, why are we discriminating against our teachers? What a great idea. And it's not just in the U.S. You've got a chaplaincy program going in how many countries now? 23 countries. And as you mentioned, is that the astounding thing is up to 80% reduction in teen pregnancies. 37% increase in graduations, and Governor zero suicides reported in that database of 27 million. Wow. Rocky, we, we just got to get the word out more. And folks, you can find out a lot more about Rocky's incredible personal story, and it is incredible. But more importantly, the life-changing work of the National School Chaplain Association and what they're doing and how you can bring it to your state, your community. If you go to Huckabee.tv, we will get you directly linked to Rocky Malloy and the School Chaplain Association. Keith, I understand we got some inspiring guests that are going to be coming up on the show. Why don't you tell us about them right now? Well, you are absolutely correct. Up next, we'll introduce you to the latest Puck's hero, Stephen Kane, who is putting music right in the hands of people that need it the most. Next on Huckabee. And welcome back. I'll tell you, one of the things I enjoy doing the show is I get to hear some phenomenal music, and it's provided by the most amazing assembly of musicians in all of Music City. I'm talking, of course, about Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. Would you give them a little appreciation? Well, I know that... You are aware of how much I believe in the power of music that heals and teaches and improves the quality of life. Well, award-winning country singer-songwriter Stephen Cade, he shares that belief, and he's doing something very special to put it into action. That's why he is this week's Huck's Hero. Watch. My name is Stephen Cade, and I'm the founder of Giving Guitars. Sometimes we forget that there's people out there, you know, without a, what they call a home. And I think that it's good to bring awareness to that and to not forget that. So since 2021, we've been going to shelters and donating guitars to people who are less fortunate. Guitars are so powerful. They, they're used for tools for songwriters to tell a story, to, to deliver a message and they're very healing as well. You know, for veterans who suffer from PTSD, we've found that if they play guitar, they can um, forget some of those things that they have experienced. The same thing with somebody who's lost uh, a home or lost or doesn't have a home or they've fallen in hard times. If you give them a guitar, they can um, forget some of those things that they have experienced and just focus on some of the positive things. They'll refocus their attention to play that guitar, to learn it, and maybe they'll even help others to help others. And maybe they'll teach other people to, to play the guitar as well, which is pretty powerful. A guitar for me is, is super relaxing. When I sit down with a guitar, everything melts away. Yeah, and so what better reason to, to, to donate a guitar than know that that brings healing to me. Why shouldn't I give that to somebody else? That seems like a great gift to donate a guitar to somebody who can write a song, tell their story. It brings people together and it just, it makes the world a little brighter. Please welcome country singer-songwriter and founder of Giving Guitars, 
Stephen Cade. Stephen, great having you so here. So great to be here with you, Governor. Watching that video, I mean, I love this because I, I know that there is power in music and you hand a guitar to someone, they learn how to play that. And I've always said, if, if you put guitars in the hands of people, they may not have time to put a gun or a knife in their hand to do damage to others. They may do something special. What first motivated you to, to start giving guitars? Well, for many years, I've been an artist. And, uh, you know, there, my family and I, we went through some tough times. And we we really found out what it was like to not to be able to pay rent. And, mm. um, you know, even where, where was that money going to come for groceries? And But God got us through that time. You know, he, he took us through that valley. And music and guitars was a way for me to express myself to, as a therapy. It was like healing for me. And Basically, in, in the summer of 2021, um, I was performing in Brentwood, Tennessee for a private event at um, our dear friends, uh, Brent and Christina Yates. And um, they are the most generous people on the planet. And, um, my, you know, they, they saw that I came with my family to the event and they saw that I was singing, you know, mostly like positive music. Mm -hmm. And they're like, why don't you, um, you know, pray about how God can use your talent to help others to help others. So we were driving in Texas and... Uh, and my wife's like, hey, babe, what about uh, giving guitars to homeless shelters? And so yeah. um, so we took that idea back uh, to Brent and Christina. They're like, yeah, we want to help you uh, get that started. So it's it's been a, a amazing. How many guitars have you been able to give away? We have donated close to 200 guitars. And um, we have been to 91 shelters across 16 states wow. in the last two years. That's fantastic. <laughs> when, when you first show up with a guitar and you're going to a homeless shelter, I'm sure people are saying, what? A guitar? <laughs> but, well, but it's got to be, it's something tangible. They can put their hands on it. It is. And you, you know, you see the eyes light up, especially in the kids, you know, that are in these shelters and they want to hold the guitar. They want to play a chord. They want to learn. And in fact, when we go there, uh, you know, some of these shelters, they, they already start wanting to form worship bands, which is really cool. And, and they, um, you know, they really just, they, they start to use it as music therapy and people will come up to me and say, Hey, Steven, you know what? I've never been able to afford to go to a concert before. Mm. So thank you for coming in and, and singing and lifting us up with that. So it's been pretty tremendous. Have there been stories that just melted your heart when you presented the guitar and you realized this was this was not just a musical instrument, this was a life changing moment. Oh, 100%. A lot of the stories are people that come in with nothing. They're at rock yeah. bottom. I mean, they, they don't have a home. They don't have food. So they'll come in and, and uh, you know, their, their stories are so powerful because they'll come in and they'll be like, I went through this program and then I... I made it out of the program and now I'm serving back here as, as the director or the volunteer. And it's just stories in, in, in our nation or really even in the world that should be stole, you know, told about these, I call them angels on earth. They're, they're just, they're heroes themselves. Stephen, I think you're doing it. I really do. This is an exciting concept. I love the fact of helping people to be able to put music, not only in their hands, but in their hearts, their souls, and to share it with others. I have a feeling many of you might wanna follow Stephen Cade, find his music and help him uh, support the mission of giving guitars. And you can do that if you go to Huckabee.tv. We will connect you to Stephen. You might decide you want to give some guitars to what he's doing and help him put those guitars in homeless shelters across this country. Well, Keith isn't homeless, at least not anymore, but he does have something that he is conjuring up for us. Keith, why don't you tell us about it? Oh, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Magic is on deck with the amazing duo, The Conjurers. You don't want to miss it next on Huckabee. TV and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs and t-shirts. Now through Monday, get an extra 25% off orders of $50 or more. And welcome back. Now, my next guests have amazed audiences all over the world, as well as on Masters of Illusion and Penn and Teller Fool Us. They're the first ever magic duo from England to become Las Vegas headliners. And you can catch their show called The Cabin of Wonders at the Orleans Hotel and Casino in 
Las Vegas. I want you to give a big welcome. Their first appearance here on our show. My guess is it won't be their last. Please welcome Matthew Pomeroy and Natasha Lamb, a.k.a. The Conjurers. Every show we go on a magical journey and discover new stories. In fact, we have one to share with you now. So my grandma was born in Guernsey and every single week she'd go to the cinema or the picture house as she calls it because she thinks she's posh. She'd go in, she'd sit down, she'd eat popcorn and drink her favorite drink, chocolate milk. And she'd wait for the movie to start. She loved getting lost in somebody else's world, lost in somebody else's story. Then one night after the movie ended, a man walked out on stage holding a red balloon on a red piece of thread. He was an amateur magician. He was relocated during the war from Holland to Guernsey. In the day he sold flowers, but a night, a night he did that one trick with the red balloon on the red piece of thread. And my grandma loved it. She loved it so much. She went back week after week, month after month, but not to see the movie. The movie became irrelevant. She wanted to see the man. Well, fast forward about six months and that man and my grandma began talking. <laughs> fast forward a year, they began courting or dating. Fast forward two years and they got married. And that man became my granddad, that's true. And we are about to see is my favorite effect in the entire world. It's definitely the reason why we're here tonight. So it is my pleasure and privilege to share and show it to all of you. But as we are here in Music City, I'm with the incredible band. We have our band leader, Trey, here. Trey, I would like for you to please give us any number between 1 and 300. Ooh. Any, any, any number? Yeah. Okay. Um, 173. 173. 173. Right, audience, do me a favor. Everybody in here, front to the back, remember 173. And we have the super duper talented Laurie here. Now, Laurie, I have another important job for you. Okay. I need for you to think of any word that you like. And when you're ready, please share it with all of us. Uh, Christmas. Christmas? Christmas. <laughs> That's a great word. Okay, audience, help us out one final time. Please remember the word Christmas. And as you lock, store, and cement that in your mind, let's welcome the star of the show. With a thunderous round of applause, make some noise for Governor. Yeah, hi. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Hello, my friend. Thank you for joining me. Thank, Thank you, man. You have a seat. Okay. Thank you so much. You're not going to make me disappear, are you? Not this <laughs> okay. time. We'll Good. save that for a later episode. Thank you. And now, though, you. you're going to see behind the curtain. You see, normally with every magician, you see what we want you to see, but right now, yep. you're gonna see all sides. You see, I have a balloon just here, just like the one my grandma would have seen all those years ago. And if you see anything strange or untoward, feel free to let everybody out there and everybody at home know. So if you're ready and watching closely, let us try something. Life is all about balance, all about the ability to truly live in the now. And when we do that, magic can be found anywhere and in anything. So Matthew's going to snap the first piece of thread just like that. Now, if you don't mind, okay. will you check both ends for me? That sounds a little bit weird, but I want you to make sure that there are no magnets, there are no nope. wires. Nope. There's nothing strange. There's no way it could reattach or just rejoin. A basic string. <laughs> Perfect. Real then simple. in the middle, the second piece is also snapped. Okay. And just like Matthew said, Thank nothing you. added, nothing extra. So exactly nope. the same for the second piece. No wires, magnets, glue, nothing. tape. Just Lovely. String. And now the third and final piece. So I'm going to give you all three pieces. If okay. you don't mind, take them in your right hand and okay. roll them to a tiny little ball. Okay. Now here's the most important part. We want for all of you in this beautiful audience and sitting at home to imagine, but really imagine that somehow, some way, these three pieces can join and fuse back together by real magic. Let's try and create an optical illusion. I'm gonna take them back. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. And I'll place them directly on the thread and I'll go all the way around. So please do check. There's no extra pieces, nothing added, Nothing taken away. 360. Now the idea is simply this. I'll make it look like those pieces stick, hold, join, fuse, and lock to the thread. Now, of course, that's impossible, but we believe that 
anything is possible. So watch closely. And it looks perfect. But of course, that's not good enough. For this to matter, for you to care, for it to count, mm -hmm. those pieces have to join, fuse, and lock back together, but in the air. So, gently. If it falls off, we pick it back up. But would you mind blowing on that knot? Just blowing on the knot. Please. <sighs> perfect. Okay. Everybody, watch. Piece by piece, strand by strand. Happens on three. One, two, two three. Three. Whoa. And every single bit reattaches. No wonder your grandmother married your grandfather. Well, that's why. <laughs> yeah. But we can make this more impossible. Governor, earlier on, we got a random word and a random number chosen. Yes. But what about if that number was a page number? You see, here we have your brilliant book, and the number was 173. 173. Yes. Would you mind? Just turn sure. to page 173 for us. And when you get there, the idea is simply this, for the word Christmas to be on there. If that happened, of course, it would be incredible. Uh, uh, there's a problem. <laughs> which is? Page, you, someone has ruined my book. Not Torn us. Torn page 173 out of the book. Well, ah, too we bad. wanted to give you a moment and a memory that would be completely <laughs> impossible. Listen. It's torn out. So, we're going to pop this. Okay. On the count of three. Ready, Tash? One, two, three. And one piece falls out, and one piece goes... Where did it go? Right here. Now, look, check oh, this out. Okay. Right inside the inner workings of the balloon, oh, there no is way. a page. Uh, the page is uh, wrapped in a band. The band comes all the way off, just like this. Troy, did you... you <laughs> <laughs> we open it up. Any number, any word. And if you don't mind, would you tell everybody what number that is and what that top word is? The page number is 173, and circled is the word Christmas. Yes! <laughs> I don't know how they did that. That's pretty amazing. Thank you so much. We well, thank you, you, because now I probably want to go marry your grandmother. You know, I, <laughs> what a, that's incredible. She'll love that. This is, I'm going to have to ask them how they did that, but if you want to see more of the astounding magic of The Conjurers, and I can't imagine that you wouldn't want to. You can follow them on social media, but here's what it would even be better. Get tickets to their fantastic show called The Cabin of Wonders. It's at the Orleans Hotel in Las Vegas. If you go to Huckabee.tv, we will tell you exactly how to connect and get those tickets. That's our show for tonight, folks. Go to Huckabee.tv for more information on all of tonight's guests and to see an online exclusive performance by Morgan Miles. Join Huckabee next week for New York Times best-selling author Karen Kingsbury, actor Scott Reeves, and more. Thanks for watching Huckabee.